I wanted to discuss airbags in Takata with its latest recall. There's loads of reading material available online, but I'd recommend looking first at Kevin Fitzgerald's website at recallawareness.com. Uh, Kevin's a 30-year veteran of pyrotechnic devices, 15 of which he worked for Takata. He was also the go-to guy for the FBI investigation and co-authored the book In Your Face. There are a few other sites I've highlighted which are in the description below. I'm not a scientist and encourage you to do your own research. The following is just a very small amount of information I've learned reading along the way. Now look, I don't know, we've all heard of the Takata airbag recalls and the safety issues they've caused. Some recalls have seen cars have their faulty airbag replaced with a newer identical product which has been required to have the item replaced a second time. Now there have been two main issues relating to the Takata inflators the propellant used and the way the propellant is protected from moisture. Both of these issues have shown to cause instability with either inadequate airbag deployment or more commonly far too much generated charge. This has caused parts of the inflator's metal casing or associated parts to blow apart causing shrapnel to tear through the airbag and into the occupant's torso or face. Now back in the 90s sodium azide was generally used as a deployment charge but was less advantageous on account of its toxicity and the fact that it wasn't environmentally favourable. Manufacturers of inflators began using cleaner, less toxic propellants. Some were tetrazoles, some were a hybrid of different substances where some others used compressed gas. Where the driver's inflators are concerned, Takata came up with the Nardi type inflator. Nardi, or non-azide driver's inflator, would go on to utilise amino tetrazole as the propellant of choice which they produced between May 1995 and August 1999. Amino tetrazoles are an organic compound with a high nitrogen content of 80%. Now as far as I've come up with, in 2001 Takata elected to use ammonium nitrate, a compound according to experts that's highly sensitive to temperature changes and moisture and has a tendency to break down over time. These are known as the Takata Alpha Airbag and there was an urgent recall imposed for their replacement. Now I guess it depends on the source of your information. Some have stated that the propellant choice for ammonium nitrate was born from a cost viewpoint. But it was also put forth that its use was selected because it offered the most in terms of inert gas output, allowing for inflators to be smaller and lighter. PSAN or phase stabilised ammonium nitrate units without a desiccant, or drying agent if you like, or with a calcium sulphate desiccant to protect the propellant from moisture also had a design defect. This was where the propellant was exposed to moisture and therefore degraded, promoting instability. This does beg the question though. You know, in the case of high humidity areas where the desiccant becomes saturated and can no longer resorb moisture, what then? As far as I've been able to research, Takata marketed the new ammonium nitrate equipped inflators in 2001. Now, a representative from Autoliv, a rival Swedish American company who supplied General Motors in the US, stated that the Takata inflator was 30% cheaper than the existing units supplied by Autoliv. Autoliv got hold of some of these Takata units and gave them to their chemical engineers who were appalled at the choice of propellant used and its propensity for instability. Warnings were sent out to automakers, but of course, those warnings went unheeded. As a side note, Autoliv later had an airbag recall issue in 2016. This was where affected Prius and Lexus vehicles had problems with their curtain airbags, but that was due to a subcontractor's inferior welded joints. Getting back to Takata. One person who survived a faulty inflator was an American Air Force Lieutenant Stephanie Erdman. There's a video of her describing the event with a horrific photograph of her post-collision with a large metal fragment embedded in her eye. She had numerous surgeries and permanently blind in that eye. There's a link to it in the description. So what's the latest round of Takata airbag issues? Well, Toyota, Mazda and Suzuki have all issued an additional recall for vehicles containing the affected airbags manufactured between May 1995 and August 1999. There was apparently a design alteration and process improvements were implemented to the foil seal tape which more effectively prevented moisture from entering the inflator. This involves around 18,000 vehicles in Australia of which 16,000 are starlets, around 12,000 three-door cars and 4,000 five-doors. These vehicles all use the Nardi 5AT which is amino tetracide inflators. Being such old cars it was thought that there's likely a limited number still on the road but like the mid-90s here at IXL, they're still certainly around. Now the inflator is no longer produced and the idea of researching and remanufacturing a new replacement isn't economically viable. So Toyota have offered to buy back all defective road registered vehicles for current market value which I would assume would be probably in the neighbourhood of $1,500. This leaves owners in a bit of a pickle as replacement runabout is far more costly than what a starlet or equivalent is worth.
and disconcerting that an airbag will render the vehicle unroadworthy. The state government has also articulated that these vehicles will no longer be able to be registered for road use. There's a lot of information on this topic available and my advice is to have a good read. If you don't own one of these affected vehicles, you may still come into contact or travel in one. My opinion, this is not going to go away in a hurry. I think there's going to be a lot more of it. I'm thinking of the early 1980s Mercedes-Benz cars with the first airbags. At almost 40 years old, are they still as good as when the cars were new? Are these chemical compounds deteriorating over time? People have been smashing old 60s, 70s and 80s cars for years and fatalities and injuries sustained by vehicle occupants have been relative to a host of different parameters and they're dependent on the circumstances of the collision. In the case of unsafe cars, it may be due to the age of the design or lack of inbuilt safety kit or it may be weather conditions, worn consumables such as tyre suspension or brakes or it may be speed or lack of visibility. It could be any number of things. After all, old cars designed and built with their limited safety parameters may still be safe relative to their age and design by maintaining them correctly and driving them just as they are. Old cars. As far as I'm aware, there's yet to be a decision made to ban the entire model lineup of the vehicle for road use based on the data collected from road trauma. Now, if these airbag complications repeatedly arise in some older models where it isn't economically viable, to design, test and manufacture replacement inflators, well, I think it's foreseeable that it may be the case. Now, I much prefer to drive older cars. Taking into consideration what I said before, I feel more like I'm driving. I'm more in touch with the vehicle. I turn the headlights and wipers on when I want to. There's heating and air conditioning, which has the settings left where I last had them. I change gear when I want to and so on. New vehicles incorporate loads of electronic devices which promote safety, but also well, dare I say, promote complacency and laziness. You could argue that the modern motorist is removed from the true art and feeling and mechanical sympathy while they drive. There are only a few of us now who still drive a stick shift. So we can keep our old cars safe relative to when and how we use them. But with airbag equipped vehicles, we're talking about a compound which can potentially alter its phase and therefore its behavior. Even in a sealed environment where the humidity equation is removed, there's still issues of time and temperature. Now Matt Moran made a video about keeping kids safe in cars, it's called the unconventional oven. It sees the interior of his car reach 72 degrees Celsius and he cooks a steak in it. Now seeing that, I don't know. What explosive elements are safely stored in an environment where the heat cycles fluctuate so regularly and to such an extent and yet there's no alteration in the behaviour of the explosive substance? Food for thought I think. Anyway that's enough chat for now. Let's do some work on the old Staley. Oh, hang on a sec, no, one more thing, and I'm not trying to be like Columbo. Take a look at these pictures. I have three Starlet driver's airbags here, and we'll take a look in a moment. Thankfully, they're all from inflation systems in Moses Lake, Washington, but there's an issue. It's the same address as the Takata plant. Oh dear. Still, they are a different classification and came up clean on the bin search through the ACCC and Toyota. Yeah, pretty unnerving stuff really. Looking at this pic, it's interesting that Takata isn't mentioned on mine flatters yet. This one mentions both inflation systems and Takata. This one shows a new cap and booster tube through manufacturing. The booster tube has been known to blow apart, ramming half of it against the steering column and shooting the other half out through the airbag. It also shows the holes where the charge exits to inflate the airbag and those holes are also shown in this picture. This is at the front of the inflator, fitted inside the bag. And a diagram of the airbag inflator itself. And finally some rusty examples. Pretty unnerving though. Too much talking. Let's go do some work. I'm trying to find some polo parts. A door. I might be in the wrong location. God, I remember all these things being brand new. There's a polo and there's another Starley around here somewhere. There's not bloody there. I wonder where the heck it is. Hundi. They're a game changer, those things. Hmm. Dunno. Oh. Folio. I don't need a door. And that is the door. That's perfect. Freaking loose, though. What's going on here? Oh, someone's taking a hinge. 
That makes it easier for me, hey? I'm gonna take that off. How did he just come out of here? Right, okay. That's nice and easy. That's cool. Stully! Someone has taken the power steering pump. Reservoir is still there though. It's not a bad thing to get. Just getting the rack out on these is a bastard. Well, I'll take the airbag out. It's probably a Takata. Okay, it's not a power pack car. So it doesn't have your central locking and mirrors and all that sort of stuff, but it is power steered. These are better make than mine, too. These rear. Those plastic rear trims, they're much better than mine. This would have been a nice little car. Right, well, I'm not too sure what I'm going to do with this. The paint I got for this guard here, it's all dusty, but it was colour matched off a faded part. I think it was a fuel cap on this car. And it's going to show up down the side, it's going to look terrible. So, I don't know. I'm going to go with the thought, I might go up there as well, with the thought like I did on a house where paint blistering, you cover the edge of it and it stops blistering. <laughs> we'll see if it works. I did on the house. So if it goes all belly up and bad, it doesn't matter that much because it can't look any worse, right? So I'm just going to try and feather that. There's a line in the car there. And I don't want to go beyond that, so I'm just going to just give it about two passes and then clear it. And I don't know how that's going to go, but it's got to look better than it does now. I think the first thing we'll do is we'll pop the indicator out. Okie dokie. How do you come out? You just come back. Then. There we go, with the cobwebs. Beautiful. This is rather poor. I've just got some 240 and I'm feathering that edge, which is going badly. But at the present time, I don't really care. I just want it to look just a little bit better than it did. And even then, that's doubtful. Um, so the idea is, we're just going to dust over it, and then we're going to re-clear it down to there. Which I don't think is going to work. I think we're going to end up re-clearing the whole bloody thing. But I don't know. If we can make it just look a tiny bit more presentable than it is, I'm cool with that. And if it's knackered by next summer, I'm even more cool, because by then I will repaint the other guard. But I've got to get the XC out, and I've got to etch some of the um, bare metal on it, and I've got to do a bit more bashing around on it to level it out. But I reckon by doing this, if we cover that in clear, then wet sand the clear, I reckon you'll hide all this. That's the thinking. I don't know how good it's going to be. No idea. This looks like total ass. But, I've gone over it with some six. I'm staying away from all down there. Really what you do is you strip the whole thing and you paint it again. You can't repair dodgy old paint like this. You can still feel that a bit I suppose, but I don't know if it, I don't, I don't know if I care. I'm well and truly through the clear now. Alright, I reckon I'll clean this up. And... Mask it off, I guess. Can we make this look any worse? I mean, yeah. Well, I, think, I think so. Yeah. I mean, you're already doing a great job, so. <laughs> great? Yeah, I don't think there's too, no, there's not too much that's great about this. No, I just think you're doing so well for. Making it look worse? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think there is a good chance that this will look infinitely worse than what it does. Uh, but I think. At the end of the day, on a 300 buck car, it doesn't matter that much. I have to cover up the wheel though, because I don't want to get overspray all over that. Hellish. <laughs> I don't think that's going to look terribly good, but I think 
a temporary newspaper out in the driveway gig, I think it's going to be all right. It doesn't look too bad. I'm just shooting a bit of acrylic clear on it. I'm not using the two-pack one. There's a bug just gone into it. Oh, at the very end. And I'm putting it on quite thick. You can still see where it was, but a bit better than it was. Right, well, like an idiot, I took the column out. And it was the Sigma that had the different column on the power steer cards. These don't. So I ended up paying 60 bucks for a column plus ignition switch with a key. Which I don't need. It was just that sort of bottom linkage to the rack there. So I've come back to get the rack out. This is pretty unusual in that it didn't have air conditioning on it. But it also has body side mouldings. Very unusual. It's also unusual that a car that was in this sort of wreck. In this sort of condition, sorry, was in a wrecker. Hmm. So I've never seen one with power steering and not air conditioning. Upcoming jobs, we've got this uh, camper for Dave. Got to clean it up. I'm not really sure how I'm going to go around this because it needs bodywork and he doesn't want bodywork. He just wants to clean it up. But I don't know. I don't know how the heck I'm going to do that. It's a beautiful original van. Um, the problem is some old guy's got like house paint, I think. We've got surface rust and all sorts of stuff, so I'm going to have to figure out. I don't, I don't know what to do with it. This polo, I'm going to change the door out. There's one at the wrecker. Um, but it's been sort of digging off the door trim, seeing how it's secured. A lot of um, Torx bit type things. So, hinges are just one bolt, each one. So there's one at the wrecker I'm going to go and take off. Um, went there yesterday, but didn't have my Torx bits. And while I was there... There's a Starley haul, and I've already got a Starley and don't need another one. But I did have the idea of doing a different one. Um, in England, I drove a Golf Mark 1 GDI, and it was brilliant. And another car that sticks in my mind is an Integra that I drove years ago. Well, I rode a 416 used to fix them. That was good fun. And an N14 Pulsar 2 litre. And the problem with Starleys is they've got no power. Now, power steering rack really really difficult to get you never see them so while it was there I took it out and there's the reservoir over there I've capped all these off for storage we don't need them yet the brackets and all the bits and pieces couple of indicators um, ran out of right ones because an old guy in the retirement village my mum lived in ran into it and broke one so I used my spare one the column I don't think we needed um, it's this bit here this slip joint that's shorter on a power steered car because they're taller in the rack so I didn't really need the column, that was another 60 bucks I didn't need to spend, but um, if I get a pre-98 um, one, eventually, then we'll need that. Uh, so I've got everything here, I've got a full air conditioning kit, I've got all the essential locking, your taco dash, everything to make another one. Um, but I want a 1.5 engine, a Paseo engine, and the power steering bracket is different, or the pump bracket. So, that's something for later on. These bits can all go into storage. While I was there, I also picked up this mint steering wheel. And you never see these in good condition. This is better than the one in my car. Um, the car I'm tipping was a write-off. Um, written off by the insurance company because it had a Takata airbag. It looked fairly complete, but it was missing its airbag, which makes me think it was a Takata. Tidy recalled 16,000 of them, and I'm tipping that's what happened. They're doing a buyback at the moment, so they give you market value, which would be like 1,500 bucks or something. And so people relinquish the car, take the cash, and the car goes to the wreckers, either that or the crusher. So there's a lot of them about to come up, I think. Uh, Volkswagen Polo, we've talked about this before. A smashed up door, and a replacement. Um, went to the wreckers, pulled it out, stuck it in the back of the Starley. And that little guy cost me $109. So I think we'll pull it apart now. And lots of torque bits. So all we need to do is just strip it out and paint it 
stick it on. It's easy getting this off on the car. Then it is on a then it is on here. Not well thought out. It's all modular in its um, how it's all fitted. And you've got fittings like this that slot in and then turn around and lock. So it's it's a bit different from anything I've worked on. There's another one there. Can I get behind it and push it? That glass should come out now. That glass should come out. Right. Interestingly, VW only had one bolt holding the hinge on. And it's sort of a pin arrangement with a pinch bolt going through it. But it's easier when the one's off the other door. It's amazing. <laughs> door handles are tricky. We've got a pull. It's a hole behind here somewhere. There's the hole, there's the hole, in here, put a hook in there, pull the back of this, then that will release, then we can unclip the handle from the front. Really, really weird how they do it. It's a whole lot of surprises here. There's a little filler panel with a very small torque bit behind here. So... We have stripped the door down, give it a clean, lots of dust and that sort of thing in here. So it's pretty good now. So we've got a storm coming. So, this was like a hundred bucks. How cool would it be being able to get a door for an XC? Half as clean as this for 100 bucks, 109 dollars. If you think about the, um, I've scratched it there, but I don't care. The paint was flawless before, before I got to it. But you know, just a window motor for one of these is probably 800 dollars, and it came with all that. But uh, all we need to do is really just scuff this. I am going to prime it, and then I'll just paint it white. And we should be good. These door seals, I've got to paint the neck to get off. A lot of this stuff is quite complicated, but not complicated, complicated, but just sort of there's tricks to doing it. If you knew what you were doing with it, it'd be a very quick job. But check it out. It's absolutely superb. Right. Hang on, just move him down. It's completely flawless. So that's a nice easy repair. Ooh, hang on, I've got some crap there. But it's not there. Yeah, beautiful, easy job to do. And I'll just secure these on the new door. This half, if you take that cap off, it's like a spline drive type thing. You leave that on the body of the car and literally just hang it on like a gate. I'm hoping there's a block connector behind here so I can set up the loom in the new door um, without too much fuss. I'll just, I'll, re, I'll repair the sill, but it's not pushed in much. Interestingly, that's got surface rust, and the Staley, the grey one I had, I had paint strip on it, left it outside, and there was no rust at all because they were galvanised. I'm not sure these are galvanised, which you would think in Europe they would be. But um, that'll sort all that out. The rest of it's good. And we'll just get a bonnet when one of those comes up. Um, and a grill, and I reckon we're good. We're out of it then. Clean it up. Good to go. So a storm coming. Starly. Okay. 
Now we've done this very badly. We've blended well here, but we haven't blended well there. You can see in the metallic, it's blotchy. Now that wasn't really done by design, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to teach little Rosie how to fix that. I thought it was good. See, it's not good there. It doesn't matter. This is just a daily beater. But the paint on this car is it's been painted before, but it hasn't been painted in the right colour. So that slightly different colour, yeah, it doesn't really match. It looks worse on the camera than in the eye, actually. But you can see it fades out to almost silver, so that transition there is great. So to do this properly, it means painting the whole side of the car. The door's good, but we've got damage at the back here above the rear wheel arch. So that's going to be fine for now. We've just got to get a little rosy. I'll teach you how to use a gun and blend that, and we'll be good to go. So on the bench, we've got three Starly airbags. We've got the one from the red car that we disassembled a few years ago, one out of my little blue runabout, and another one out of Charlie's car, the burgundy one. Now, none of these cars, the VIN numbers on any of these cars, came up as faulty on the latest search um, on the website for the 95 type faulty airbag from Takata. And they're all from, it doesn't scream what the brand name is here. You can just see a little tear section there. But none of them are corroded. They all look fairly good. Now, airbag gas generator. That number there, BAM. I don't know if you can see that where you are. PT10593. That will tell you, when you Google it, what the um, classification of the airbag is. This would be 91 through 94. So I'm not sure what the propellant is. It's manufactured by, eh, where is it? Inflation Systems Incorporated, Moses Lake, uh, Washington, USA. Now they're all marked with the same propellant. They're all from Inflation Systems, but there's a thing with that which is worth noting. And I'll get to that in a moment. Now in the wiring of the car, I haven't seen anything that looks like a sensor. Um, the airbag module or the SRS modules here. This is a spare. It tells you not to disassemble it. I did take the back off and have a look. Um, I don't know if the decelerometer type device which sets these things off is inside here. I'm assuming it is because I haven't seen it anywhere else in the car. What does make me a little bit nervous, um, oh, before I go any further, seatbelt pretension is these are another thing. They've got a little piston down the bottom here. Charge goes off, piston flies out that way and yanks the seatbelt tight. Now this is a different brand again. Uh, there are a few manufacturers of these things. Um, where is the brand name? Take Rica Company Limited. And that's made in Japan, I would think. Now what's a bit of a concern, all this Takana business and all this sort of stuff, is in the latest one, the sealing tape has allowed uh, moisture to get in, making the propellant unstable. Even sealed off, you'd think that it's going to break down anyway. It's a chemical compound. Now, if you look at plastics, they break down. Any any compound over time is going to break down. Might as well fit this much better $33 steering wheel in. This one's a bit sort of flaky. Um, not the original one that came with the car. But, hang on. I need a shorter extension. But, it's better than the one that was in here before. I might just get a shorter extension to get the rest of this off. Now, behind here is a clock spring or spiral cable if you prefer. There's a little earth there, we'll take that off. And we just want to rock it to and fro until it relinquishes like that. Make sure it's straight ahead. And the clock spring will only go back um, a certain, it'll only go a couple of turns either way and there's a couple of keys in the back of the wheel there. I just have to take one of those screws out, just a moment. Let's pop the airbag up there for a moment. I've just got to take one of these screws out of the back of this because it's missing one and pop it in the new one there well it's not new but it's taking a lot better than what we've got um all right so that's the flaky one and just put this new one in now and hopefully the last one i got looked really good but it was bent it looked like the motorist had um hit it so there's a couple of keys on this clock spring there's one at the very top and of course there's two down the bottom I don't know if you can see them where you are but I'll show you on this one so it's going to mesh up with those and that and there they are in there so where did this come through the top? that 
goes there, the earth cable goes through, that'll be for the horn. And we just stick him on dead level. Is this friggin' thing turned? Oh no, there it is there. And this the clock spring has seated itself, so that's good. Right. Well, let's tighten him up. Pop the earth on. That's a bit mangled at the top. Maybe I should take it off again and just put the other top on. I think I will. Right, so I've changed that over. Let me just put this guy in. Oh, where does that go? It goes like that. The battery's disconnected. And that will just click in. And then we've just got to put the two securing screws in from there and there. That's much better. Cool. Right. My goodness, look at this mess. I've got to have another cleanup. All right, so yeah, look, this isn't the type of video I normally do where I'm banging on about airbags and all that sort of stuff. I did do a fair bit of research and read about probably 30 to 40 articles before I sort of wrote it because there was a lot of stuff I didn't know. And this is only a very small snippet of the information that's available on them. Um, I've just kept it to the Toyota, and the, particularly the Starlet. Um, but if you have got one of those cars, they're not a safe car. They're very small. You, you, you feel quite vulnerable in them. I use mine just for the shopping trips and to cart my mother to the local shops because she can get in, being quite a long door. But for trips, I wouldn't, I wouldn't take it. I wouldn't be surprised if all of this stuff keeps rearing its head. And ones like mine, which are 91 to 94, are also affected. And those cars will be deregistered too, so there'll be bugger all 98, 99 cars around. Because they're just not safe on account of an airbag. So, yeah, anyway, look, that's all I've got for you now. Um, take good care of yourself, enjoy a classic, and I'll see you around.